So this is the third week. Uh, I know a couple probably the first time here, so I'm going to do some things to sum up some of the major things we've developed and then go further today. Um, I'm going to start with Philippians chapter 3, 20 through 21, as a way to pull together a lot that we've been talking about for the last two weeks and be sure it's totally anchored and rooted in Jesus, as it should be. So let me pray and we'll jump in. Father, I thank you for this church. I thank you that this church is a hotbed of optimism, of optimism on our role of dominion and uh, of rule, of the power that you've granted us from Jesus at the right hand of the Father, victorious, to be faithful, to be fruitful, to make a difference down through the generations. And thank you for the worship and the leadership. And thank you that uh, this church, we are attracting so many people who have a heart and a desire for that. I pray that you would continue to stir us up and use this time and this fellowship and these scriptures to extend and deepen our passion to match in some weak way, but in a true way, your passion for the transformation and renewal of all things, especially in the way we think about and go about our work on a daily basis. Thank you that you are with us for that. Amen. So Philippians 3 starts like this, for our citizenship is in heaven. Now, this is one of those phrases in the scripture that can easily lend itself to a way of thinking that actually diminishes our work, that makes us think of work, the things you're going to be doing at 8 o'clock in the morning, and all those things is somehow secondary. I, I know I alluded last week to the often used idea of why am I arranging the deck chairs on a sinking ship, and other things that tend to foster this idea that makes us feel like our work is always somehow inferior or secondary to the things that God really cares about. So, um, and I was thinking about this this week. I, Campus Crusade, which is now Crew, had a major impact in my life. That's how I found my wife on Campus Crusade staff. And Bill Bright, who was the founder of Campus Crusade, a godly man, a godly servant, a true visionary. But one of the things that he and staff would often say when they were recruiting other people to come on staff, ministry staff, is this. Why give the best 40 hours of your week to the world? So that means if I'm an engineer or if I'm a salesman or if I'm a plumber, I'm giving the best 40 hours of my week to the world. Now... Thank God for those who are called and faithful in full-time ministry, whether missionaries, or pastors, and that is clearly part of God's wisdom in the building of his church and of his kingdom and the spreading of his truth to the nations. Thank God for those who are generous and faithful to support that work. But those ideas, especially that idea, and that had an impact on me at about 20 years old. Why give the best 40 hours of your week to the world? That is a tragic thought. It makes work inferior. It is, destroys, I think, the passions and the zeal and the wisdom that God wants us to have toward our work. So let's go back to this verse. For our citizenship is in heaven. And Paul goes on to say, and we're just hanging here till we can gain our full salvation by getting there. Anybody know what Paul says next in this verse? For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior. And what's that Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, going to do? What is his saving work as described in this verse? Who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. This is a heaven and earth Thing, rooted deep all the way back to Genesis 1, affirmed in places like Psalm 89 and Psalm 110 and Isaiah 9 and Jeremiah 30 and Amos 9 and many, many other places that say that God who rules in heaven and Jesus now who's been anointed as the victorious Messiah, God has said yes to all his promises in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians, as Jesus there rules, the point of that rule in heaven is to bring that rule to earth which is exactly what this verse describes. 
So the point of our citizenship being in heaven is we know that the roots of our confidence is with Jesus at the right hand of God as the victor. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And by saying my kingdom is not of this world, he said, I don't care about, he's not saying I don't care about this world. The, the, the place of my rule and authority doesn't derive from this world. Like so many other rulers and people in power feel like their power and authority derives from. It derives from God. It derives in heaven. And so Jesus now rules at the right hand of God. Why? What is he doing there? His great passion is to bring that rule to earth and to complete that rule. And for you and I to be part of that rule every day in the way we work. Jesus is the second Adam, the renewed image of God. First Jesus and then us in Jesus. He shed his blood, Revelation 1 and 5, so that we might reign on the earth. So all of this affirms the things that we've looked at over the last couple of weeks. That God loves his creation. That as God loves his creation, it's good, it's good, it's good, it's very good. Then he passes off this baton to you and I as the image of God. And as we discuss in Genesis 2, the essence of who we are is that we are made from the earth and that we are made for the earth. Romans 8 that we talked about both weeks, that our chief identity is in that we're made to rule over the earth and to multiply and to spread God's rule and dominion, his peace, his righteousness, his love, his truth. Psalm 90 that we looked at last week, or two weeks ago, that when God's eternal life floods into this world of sin and death, it doesn't diminish the works of our hands. It's actually just the opposite. Psalm 90 says the point of that eternal life flooding into our world of sin and death is to establish the works of our hands, for him to be with us in the works of our hands. And so resurrection here in this passage and throughout all that Paul teaches and throughout the New Testament is God not opening up a path for us to get out of here, but resurrection is the claiming of this world. It is the overcoming of death and all the enemies of God. Resurrection, Jesus' is resurrection, and then ours, as Philippians 3 says, that he will transform our bodies into conformity with his glorious resurrection body, which as we talked about the first week, that is actually more earthy than bodies like ours that are dying and the decay. Jesus' resurrection body is actually more earthy. And our resurrection bodies, when he gives us the fullness of those bodies, will be more earthy, more suited for rule and work and productivity in his creation. And so that's why he taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the glory. Jesus is victorious in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven because he is there as the victor. He is our righteousness. He is our strength. He is our power to live this out. He is our glory to bear fruit every day in our work and in our lives. And his passion is for us to do exactly that. So the fact that Philippians 3 says our citizenship is, is in heaven is why Ricky, the first person, first example I gave two weeks ago, Ricky at the downtown rescue mission can lay brick to the worship of God because he knows his citizenship is in heaven. And he can be part of heaven coming to earth in how he lays brick every day with excellence, with beauty, with a heart to serve. It is why uh, the lady I mentioned last week at the, at the DMV that I saw a couple of years ago who was so diligent and such a servant in an atmosphere where you don't expect that, that truly, and I remember I was sitting there with Jennifer watching that, and I remember saying to Jennifer, I said, you know, that lady's got to be a Christian. I said, look at that woman, Jennifer. That is heaven coming to earth. She is submitting to the rule of King Jesus, to his heavenly glory, and she is spreading it right here in the DMV of all places. So uh, we've talked about things like overcoming the zero-sum way of thinking about things and the way we think about paying people and the way we think about giving up ownership to employees and to, and to think in a Christian way of dominion and expansion rather than the zero-sum way that the world tends to think, which often behind is woven in, greed is often woven into that, is a way of bringing heaven to earth, is a way of our citizenship in heaven becoming real. I mentioned last week the example of two men at the downtown rescue mission working in the laundry, and the ladies had commented how there's some time when they come over to pick up their clothes, 
There's some that seem to really fold their clothes with diligence and with care about how those clothes are folded so that the women will enjoy that. You know, they, they, they realize that the ladies like their clothes folded neatly. And so these were two men who really gave their heart to God to do that. That is heaven coming to earth. That is our citizenship in heaven becoming realized in real life and daily life. Respect for authority. When we give respect to authority, especially, we'll talk about this next week in some detail in 1 Peter, but authority that we don't want to give respect to in an earthly, fleshly way, but we give respect to that authority, that is Jesus' victory becoming manifest in our hearts and spreading out into the world and showing the good works of God, showing the faithfulness of God for his creation. All of this is heaven coming to earth. When we just exude joy, in our work. This past week, well, Friday, actually, Kyle, one of our, with our sister law firm, I heard Kyle in there doing a closing, real estate closing. Kyle's a great Christian man, and, and Kyle was just so positive. When he does a closing, he's just, he just pours out happiness because he's getting to serve these people. He's getting to bring about something that is important to them to buy this house and make all this happen and coordinate everything with the lender and all the different moving parts that have to take place to do that. But Kyle in there was just so happy, and I told him after that, I said, Kyle, I said, you just give such witness to Christ in the joy you take in doing a real estate closing. That's a beautiful thing. Now, one of the things I had skipped a couple weeks ago was in, in the early notes, and I don't even have a copy of my notes, but where I put the note of, uh, can I look at your notes right quick? The way that it was phrased. Yeah, epistle surprise and challenge. What's all this earthy stuff doing here? So I, I never had time to get to that, but, uh, but this would be a good context to come back to that. So what that is referring to, when I was in college and involved with camp and campus ministry, uh, my campus minister, staff guy, Bobby, great guy, great friend. But we were reading through some of Paul's epistles. And I remember commenting to Bobby one time. I said, you know, I said, it's odd the way Paul does these epistles. He talks about the gospel and Jesus' death and resurrection. And I would think, and as you know, so often we look at Paul's epistles and say, well, here's kind of the doctrine section and here's the application section. And I would think that Paul would go straight to the application section, say, therefore, spend all your focus on telling people how they as an individual are going to get their soul to heaven. But instead, he always talks about husbands and wives, masters and slaves, respecting your authority, just earthy things, daily things. And I remember telling Bobby, I said it, and and I said it kind of tongue-in-cheek, but I said, it seems like Paul needs to get on board with us here. (laughs) And and Bobby, to his credit, said, you know, he said, that's a good point. He said, I guess it is kind of surprising that Paul always seems to go to these down-to-earth things is what it means that Jesus has been crucified for our sin, raised from the dead, and is victorious at the right hand of God in fulfillment of the prophets. And yet, that's gospel. That's exactly what we should expect as we let the whole scripture speak to us on these things. So last week, we focused on Psalm 104. So the first week, we developed a lot of these things, and then we came back to Psalm 104 is a place where the psalmist really kind of goes on a riff, a poetic riff of meditating upon Genesis 1 and 2, and then applying it and thinking it through in a very beautiful way, a beautiful description of God's love, for his work and his creation, and then the amazing way he brings us into that work to be a part of it. And there are three things, and I'm not going to read those verses again. They're in your notes because we're going to pick up at the end of Psalm 104. But there's three things that we focused on last week out of that psalm. First, in your notes, it deepens our appreciation of God's work in Genesis 1 and 2. So Psalm 104 gives a glorious picture of God's order, of God's love of order, of God's wisdom woven into his creation, of his creativity, his beauty, the the little touches of creation that God loves, the productivity, the blessing, and that God's just delights in all those things. He just loves all those things. I listened to a podcast this week, and by the way, the podcast that Larson and Rich did with um, David Bonson, also listened to this week, is really profound 
and outstanding. But my son Hunter had sent me a podcast this week from a guy who has a big uh, private equity company, Shore Capital. And Hunter finds this guy really fascinating. And so I listened to it. It's really, really good. And there's nothing I heard that, tell, that would suggest to me this guy's a Christian. He may be, but there's really nothing in the way he talked about it. But the heart of what he talked about that is the heart of how they buy companies and then put CEOs and boards together to run those companies and try to make them productive. If you really listen, and he's using a lot of lingo in the private trust world, I don't even understand. But the heart of it is, fi- is to find people that take joy in what they do, that take joy in being productive, that love to see things flourish. And I thought, man, Christians ought to be owning that. In every business, in every work, whether it's at the laundry room at the downtown mission or whether it's an engineering company or whatever it is, we ought to be the people full of joy and that people think, man, you just, you're just happy in what you do and you just take such joy and we can connect and we can then connect dots of how we are joining the creator and the recreator in that joy. Of course, we should have joy in everything we do. And so first is it deepens our appreciation. Secondly, is how work is bringing good to others. So just at the heart of our work should just be bringing good to others. And Psalm 104 gives a great description of how God takes delight in that and how then we are brought in by God's mercy and grace and kindness to be crowned with glory and honor to be a part of that. And then third, we talked about how it helps us join, join and spread the joy. And I added a word that I should have had in these notes, but not only testify to God and his goodness, not only encourage others in it, not only bless others in it, but celebrate it with other people. Uh, this Friday, Amy, uh, in our business, one of, we have two post-closers. And so Ashley, one of the post-closers, was gone for the day. And so Amy, who, and Ashley does most of the work I do on the investor side, closing, post-closing. And so we had to get Amy to do it. And so the investor side where I work is kind of crazy. I mean, a lot of times at 9 in the morning, we'll add two closings for the day. Stuff's moving all the time. Investors are like, hey, can't we do it today? Or all of a sudden, stuff falls together. So poor Amy, I told her, I said, you're going to be shell-shocked at the end of this day. But Amy, there are a couple times during the day she said, whew, okay, all right. So, okay, that just got added to the calendar. Now we got to do that or got to disperse this or got to handle this. But throughout the day, she was just pleasant. You know, somebody here a couple weeks ago had said just being pleasant in our work. What a powerful witness. But Amy was just pleasant. I mean, she'd come and ask. She'd say, I don't really understand this. Or what exactly is Kathy telling me to do with this? Or how am I supposed to handle this? But she was just pleasant. And she just had a servant's heart throughout the day. And I told her at the end of the day, Friday, I said, Amy, I said, you've been such a blessing to me today. I said, I know this has been crazy. And I know we had stuff coming at you right and left but you were just such a blessing by your attitude. I mean, we ought to be three or four times a day, we ought to be speaking to people like that. And if we're not, I'm not sure if we're really getting on board. I think if we're really listening to God and his word and we're participating in all that he calls us to in Christ, we ought to be the people constantly blessing other people, constantly pointing out to others their diligence. And, and it ought to be specific, you know, when somebody really does something above and beyond, a customer, a vendor, we ought to be the ones to say, hey, you know what? You were so diligent on this, or it was such a blessing to me when you performed this and the attitude and your, your thoroughness and how you took care of this. So help us join and spread the joy. Now, what we want to do today is two things. I want to take the last part of Psalm 104 in your notes where it says, Psalm 104, joining God in his work in the renewal of creation. And then we're going to take, if time permits, a little bit of time to jump into some of the specifics that are in your notes. And then next week, I plan to come back and and hit those, uh, most of those. So the next part of the psalm. So after the first 28 verses are this beautiful reflection and poetry of God and creation and his allowing us to join him in his work and all that we do and being productive, then... After all this great joy and beauty and productivity, he brings in sin. Verse 29 on your notes. When you hide your face, they are dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. So he's been reflecting on Genesis 1 and 2, but now he thinks about Genesis 3. And so death. 
and rebellion. Now, let me ask you, and if you can, some of you just give me some quick answers to this. But what are the effects of sin and death and rebellion in work? Lack of trust. Okay. Lack of trust. What else? Laziness. Laziness. Okay. Animosity between employers and employees, okay? And then, and then people that feed off that animosity, you know, labor unions and others that gain their power off of that animosity. All right, what else? Lying, cheating, stealing. Lying, cheating, stealing, okay, good. Lying, cheating, stealing. Not enjoying your work. Not enjoying your work. Okay, I got to go punch the clock, you know, and get through the day and, and just a listless attitude about our work. What else? That's great. Greed? Greed. Yeah. Um, a lack of diligence on the execution of things. So all of those things affect our work. So when you hide your face, they're dismayed. When you take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. So all the things that y'all just said are all part of this process of the weeds in the garden. To dust you shall return. But then verse 30. When you send your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. Now, I might be reading too much into this, but one of the things I've always loved about this is it's almost like the psalmist has been thinking about creation and work and productivity, but then he's thinking through the Bible and he thinks Genesis 3, oh man, we've got death and disease. But he, but he don't want to linger there for long. He quickly wants to say, but God doesn't leave it there. God so loves his creation. God so loves us being crowned with glory and honor in the renewal of his creation. He's going to jump right back into it. And, of course, Scripture does that for us. You know, Genesis 3, immediately the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. Uh, Genesis 5, Noah will bring rest to the creation. Abraham, Israel, tabernacle, temple, priesthood, law, land, all of those things as they develop, are not about us leaving, but they're all about God coming. God coming as King and Savior. God coming as the Redeemer. The law is about God coming to transform our work lives, our family lives, our city lives, our justice systems, according to his wisdom, going back to Genesis 1. And so the prophets, as the prophets speak of salvation and creation and the promises of God through his Messiah and through his people, they always, so many places, they connect it to new creation. They connect it to fruitfulness. They connect it to wheat and grapes and things growing up and human beings being restored to being productive in the work. Romans 8 that we looked at in some detail last week, where the work and passions of the Spirit, Romans 8, 25, 26, and then of Jesus, Romans 8, 31 through 34, that their prayers, that their groanings are for us to be renewed so that creation will rejoice. We looked at Psalm 98 last week. This is one of the many places Paul would take this whole eschatology from, that God is going to restore his image and all creation is going to rejoice. And so just catch the spirit here of the psalmist. When you send forth your spirit that created, you renew the face of the ground. So as I said, to me, part of what I see is God's passion captured here and the psalmist reflecting and helping us describe that passion. But it also ought to create passion in us. You and I ought to be so zealous to bring about God's glory in the workplace. In, in our work, in our fields of work, in the details of our work. And as we do that, we are reflecting, we are falling in line with the Spirit of God and with Jesus, the great high priest, praying for us at the right hand of God. As I mentioned last week, one of the things that always seems to kind of catch the attention when I'm teaching these things at the program at the Downtown Rescue Mission is when I say because I think it's so clearly, clear scripturally, that when you're sorting those bins at the thrift store, when you're 
working to be diligent in the laundry room or when you leave here and go as a plumber, or construction worker, or IT person or whatever you're going to do, that Jesus Christ is crying out to God for you to be excellent. As your great high priest, he is crying out, he is praying, he is joining the groanings of the Spirit for you to be renewed every day in your work, for you to be joyful in that work, for you to be excellent in that work, for you to have a servant's heart in that work. And so we need to catch that spirit because we're really falling in line with the Spirit of God as the psalm here describes. Then he goes on to say, verse 31, May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his work. So he's, at this point, the psalmist is thinking about all this. He's thinking about Genesis 1 and 2 and all the first part of the psalm and God's wisdom and God's love and God's zeal and us being brought into that in our own lives and in our own work. But he's also here thinking about the renewal, that God is coming, God is faithful through his covenant promises and people, through his Messiah to renew these things through his spirit. So he says, may the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks on the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. Here I think he's probably referring to Mount Sinai, which is kind of a touch point of this picture of God coming down and things trembling in his presence. But then that becomes a picture that is used throughout the Psalms and the prophets of when God comes to make things right. There will be trembling. There will be smoke. There will be power unleashed. Psalm 98 that we again looked at last week, it says, let the hills sing for joy before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Or another affirmation of this from Paul, when Paul is speaking to the pagan audience in Athens in Acts 17, he shares the truth. He says, the God of Israel is the God of all creation. And he ends his great sermon and call to Christ by saying this, because that God, the God of Israel, the God of creation, the God of all men, has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So again, the resurrection is the proclamation of God that he will make things right in his creation. And the resurrection then becomes our confidence to be part of making those things right in our work on a daily basis, looking forward to the great consummation. Verse 33 as the psalmist thinks about all of these things, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. May my meditation be pleasing to him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Something that I'm trying to do more in my own work, and I don't do this near as well as I should, but our work every day should start, and, and using a phrase used last week, reset. Every day should be reset through worship. Starts here with our Lord's Day liturgy and worship, and then that flowing into our week. But every day and throughout the day, there really ought to be moments of just worship. God, I'm amazed that I get to do this. I'm amazed that you gave me the ability to solve that problem, to serve this person, to work through this issue, to keep a good attitude when this or that happened. Father, I'm blown away that I get to join you in your work, that in Jesus' blood and righteousness, I am being redeemed to be a part of that work. And so that really needs to be the setting and the resetting throughout our days. And I find that makes all the difference. And, and by the way, one of the interesting things about that, I'm a lot more productive when I'm doing that. If I give in to stress, or if I get in, oh my goodness, or this person's upset, or this thing's going south, or what's going to happen here, I become a lot less productive. But when I can just stop in the middle of the day and say, God, thank you that I have the privilege. Thank you that you've crowned me with glory and honor to be doing this work. I'm a lot more productive and a lot more joyful in the things that we do. And then I can truly take it one day at a time. So Psalm 104 gives us this great creation, picture of creation, and then the renewal of creation. And at the heart of that is us working and being restored in work with God and for God. And joining God in his work. But then, the end of the psalm really throws a curveball. So, he's been talking about the birds singing in the trees. And, you know, deer drinking water at the brook. And us, you know, making wine and bread and oil to make the face beautiful. And then he's talked about the renewal of these things. But listen to verse 35. Kind of throws a bomb in here. 
He says, let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul, praise the Lord. Now, where does that come from? Why would he all of a sudden end the psalm with this? Let sinners be consumed from the earth. Let the wicked be no more. Yeah. And that's to be full, then you have to get rid of the enemy of that. Yeah, exactly. It makes him mad. You know, and, and I think really it ought to make us mad ourselves when we see laziness in our lives, when we see greed in our lives, when we see attitudes where we buy into management animosities. I mean, all of those things ought to make us angry, starting with how those things manifest in our own lives and block the beauty and the glory of work and joining God in his work. I've always found this interesting in this psalm, but the more I've thought about it over the years and the more I've taught it to mission and worked through it, I've thought this is the perfect way to end it. If we really grasp and are grasping who God is and who he is as a worker and who we are as his workers and who he is as a, as a, as a savior as the Spirit is in renewing us and renewing creation and renewing work, we ought to get ticked about things in us and things in the world that block that, that are enemies to those things. We ought to want those things to go away. God to judge those things. God to make things righteous. Really, this is a perfect ending as an expression of the love and zeal of God for all that is righteous in His creation, all that is righteous in His work. Have a... Uh, little diagram on your notes trying to capture this last part of the psalm. So sin and death and then renewal in God's love and zeal. But that includes war. That includes warfare against the things and the enemies of God that stand against those things.